disagreement in the ranks. Not only is White's argument, which is used by many Calvinists, both irrational and unbiblical, but even some Calvinist leaders disagree with it. John MacArthur Jr. recognizes that Christ is expressing the same desire for the salvation of all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that he has expressed for centuries as the God of Israel through his prophets. He declares that Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem. We cannot escape the conclusion that God's benevolent, merciful love is unlimited in extent. Luke chapter 19 verses 41 to 44 gives an even more detailed picture of Christ's sorrow over the city. And MacArthur even suggests that the city of Jerusalem represents the Israelite nation. Luther also declared, In Christ, God comes seeking the salvation of all men. He offers himself to all. He weeps over Jerusalem because Jerusalem rejects him. Here God incarnate says, I would and thou wouldst not. God incarnate was sent for this purpose, to will, say, do, suffer, and offer to all men all that is necessary for salvation, albeit he offends many who, being abandoned or hardened by God's secret will of majesty, do not receive him. In a further contradiction of his affirmation at other times of limited atonement, Spurgeon also applied Christ's words both to all of Jerusalem and to all sinners. In Christ's name, I have wept over you as the Savior did, and used his words on his behalf. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and he would not. O God does plead with every one of you, Repent, and be converted for the remission of your sins. And with divine love he woos you, crying, Come unto me. No, says one strong doctrine man, God never invites all men to himself. Stop, sir. Did you ever read, My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready? Come unto the marriage. And they that were bidden would not come. Now, if the invitation is made only to the men who will accept it, how can that parable be true? The fact is, the invitation is free. Whosoever will, let him come. Now, some of you may say that I was Armenian at the end. I cannot. I beg of you to turn unto the Lord with all your hearts. Spurgeon makes an excellent point. Christ likens the kingdom of God to a supper to which men are invited. Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 24. In the parable, there is no question that a bona fide invitation was extended, nor that many, if not most of those sincerely invited, refused, or even scorned the invitation and suffered the Lord's wrath. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Verse 24. The problem for the Calvinist is to explain how God can sincerely invite into his kingdom those for whom Christ did not die, whom he has not elected to salvation, whom he has from a past eternity predestined to eternal torment, and who can't accept because he withholds from them the grace they need then punish them for not responding to his invitation. How indeed! And why does he send his servants to compel those in highways and hedges to come in, that my house may be filled? Verse 23. If regeneration is a sovereign act of God without human response. And if faith is a gift and grace is irresistible, how could the elect refuse the earnest invitation? Spurgeon leaves these questions unanswered, knowing he will be accused of being Armenian at the end. Nor have we found any Calvinist who attempts to answer Spurgeon. The only reasonable and biblical response is to abandon Calvinism, which Spurgeon would not do, although he continued to contradict it in his preaching. 
and for pointing out these contradictions. I am criticized for allegedly misquoting and misrepresenting Spurgeon.